the shooting range. In this episode, pages of history, single roll wheeled tank, special performing Pugachev's Cobra, and metal beasts flanking the fourth generation. Time to see the new vehicles of this winter. For today's episode, we picked one of the most famous and anticipated machines. This is a legendary fourth generation fighter that rose to many challenges. And the name of this aircraft is the Su-27 Flanker. At first, it seems pretty similar to the MiG-29, but looks can be deceiving. This is a completely different plane. First, it's one of the largest and heaviest fourth gen aircraft. The machine looks smaller thanks to its lifting body design and sleek lines, but if you put this SU next to its counterparts, it's kinda obvious. Despite this impressive size, the SU-27 is neither slow nor clunky. It's actually setting a new record for the highest afterburning power in the game, exceeding 24,000 kilogram forces. With a regular fuel load and a limited payload, its power plant can provide the machine with a thrust-to-weight ratio above 1. In practice, this means that the Su-27 can remain in the air even in the sharpest or longest of maneuvers, where its speed can almost reach zero. By the way, we're going to try and perform one of the most impressive aerobatic maneuvers today, Pugachev's Cobra. See it right after Pages of History. For now, though, let's check the combat capabilities of the Su-27. And here's another War Thunder record, namely, the number of air-to-air -air missiles available. This jet can carry up to 10 of them at once. The missiles can be combined in many ways, but the classic set includes four R-27ER, two R-27ET, and four R-73 missiles, a weapon for any situation. The onboard equipment here is also pretty impressive. There's a powerful radar that helps you use radar-guided missiles at a long range, as well as an optical station and a helmet-mounted display for close range. Combined with the R-73 missiles, this heavy fighter remains dangerous even in a turn fight. Of course, we wouldn't recommend joining one when you're surrounded by enemies, even if you're piloting a top jet like the Su-27. Still, it's nice to have good chances of winning a duel in pretty much any situation. The only point lacking on the Su-27's side is its radar warning receiver. Compared to many other jets in the game, this Su is a pretty early model, and its RWR cannot tell the source of the radiation. You can live with it alright, though, since the rest of the traits of this aircraft can well compensate for its age issues. Now, this combat jet is certainly not meant for ground strikes, but it's still capable of employing conventional weaponry. We'd pick the large-caliber S-25 O rockets, 500kg bombs, and close-range air-to-air missiles. That's a simple, reliable loadout for ultra-low altitude casts. Well, we're not saying goodbye to the Su-27 just yet, but first, some pages of history. In the early 1990s, the American Army made the decisive contribution to the defeat of the Iraqi Army during Operation Desert Storm. Despite the overall success, the command discovered some major deficiencies. One of the weak points was found in the vehicles used by the airborne troops. They needed new machines with firepower similar to that of the Abrams tanks. And the deployment of those machines shouldn't take too much time or resources. Engineers offered numerous solutions, but it took the top brass quite a long time to pick a new air-droppable tank to replace the outdated and underperforming Sheridan. Years of experimenting and prototyping left a lot of unused ideas and designs. One of those was the so-called low-profile turret. It had a layout with two crew members in the turret platform and a large caliber cannon with an autoloader. General Dynamics took this idea, polished it further, and installed the modernized turret onto the striker's wheeled platform. The resulting machine was introduced into service in 2002 under the name of the M1128 Mobile Gun System. This new cannon striker soon found itself in the center of some major controversy. Despite its 105mm cannon, this machine's anti-tank capabilities were inferior to the Abrams with its 120mm cannon. The wheeler used the M900 shell, one developed for late 105mm cannons, and it was perfect for hitting older armored vehicles like the T62 or the early versions of the T72 tanks, 
but struggled with newer machines. However, improving the penetration rate of this shell was practically impossible, as the M900 was basically the best 105mm round that one could make. The cannon striker could not carry troops and was not meant for a direct confrontation with tanks. It was a highly specialized tool, a fire support machine for infantry. And that's where it truly had no rivals, at least among the United States' armored vehicles. Unlike their tracked versions, the Strikers could traverse hundreds of kilometers in mere hours with little to no preparation. Its powerful cannon also allowed it to destroy bunkers and other fortifications, a capability that the Army truly appreciated in Iraq and Afghanistan. At the same time, the M1128 turned out to be extremely expensive and not too reliable. Its numerous digital systems would often act up, and servicing them required extra skilled technicians. In the early 2000s, these machines were more expensive than some MBTs. There were thousands of striker wheelers built, but only 142 units of the M1128. Unlike the AFV, they missed out on a series of improvements and in 2021, the Department of Defense made the decision to retire the M1128. Simple, mobile ATGM systems could perform its anti-tank duties and some other cheap and reliable solutions were available for the rest of the missions. As promised, we're back with the beautiful flanker. This fighter owes a large portion of its fame to its excellent maneuverability. And one of the highlights is its ability to perform one of the most impressive aerobatic maneuvers, Pugachev's Cobra. Viktor Pugachev, a Soviet test pilot, brought it to the public eye during the Paris Air Show in 1989, adding his surname to the stunt and creating a strong link to the Su-27. We already performed the Cobra back in the spring of 2020, although it would be correct to call that one dynamic deceleration. The best aircraft for it was the Swedish Draken. It's often called the first jet in history to perform this maneuver, which happened in the late 50s or early 60s. Back in episode 200, we almost managed a 90 degree angle. Not bad, huh? But the Su-27 can do much better. First, let's empty the hardpoints and pour the smallest amount of fuel into the tanks. Not like we're going far away from the airfield, right? Now, let's dive into the controls. Even in real life, pilots disable the electrical fly-by-wire systems to perform this maneuver, since automatics tend to get in the way of extreme stunts. For the best control of the aircraft in realistic battles, we need to switch to full real controls. Open the Controls menu, Aircraft tab, and assign a key of your choosing for Toggle Control Mode. Too many controls in a sentence? Well, where we're going, we'll need a lot of control. Buckle up, we're about to take off. Now, you won't need too much speed for this stunt. 500 or 550 kilometers an hour should be enough. Fly level and switch to full reel controls using the key you've just assigned to toggle through the available modes. And here's the thing we're all here for. Push that pitch key and see the Su-27 raise its nose up. Not 90, not 100, but all of 110 or 120 degrees, and it still keeps moving forward, basically in reverse. The most surprising part about it is that this aircraft can just as easily quit this extreme position and return to level flight. So, did you like it? Let's try it again. We could watch this for hours. By the way, our game has other planes that can perform a beautiful Cobra. All you need to do is repeat the actions, so feel free to experiment. Yes, there is little use for this maneuver in combat, but it's a huge boost for the image. Like, it's not just a fighter, it's a Cobra-capable fighter. The first question was sent by a player called Loki Lindstrand. What's the best Vigan, the AJS-37 or the JA-37? Hi, Loki. You're probably talking about the Striker version and the JA-37 Modification C found on the same B-arm. Well, the AJS is better for ground strikes thanks to its wide choice of suspended armament. It even has the all-aspect RB-74, 
Still, radar-guided anti-air missiles, built-in cannon, and countermeasures that keep the hardpoints free make the fighter version a better choice for air combat. Cowboy Kirby asks, Whatever happened to drop tanks for new aircraft? I feel like you just gave up on them. Howdy, cowboy. Well, most of the new top aircraft did have their drop tanks, in fact. We might have slowed down on adding them to older models, but we never gave up on the idea. We're working on them. Another question comes from Elias Liao. What's the best F-16 out of all variants? Hey, Elias. To make this comparison simpler, let's divide all F-16s into early and late models. We'd say the MLU is the best early model since it has almost all the suspended armament types and a drogue chute to boot. As for the two late versions, it's not as straightforward. The F-16C is better in aerial combat, while the Barak II is more efficient in CAS. There's also the Japanese F-16 with its amazing camos. We think it deserves a shout-out for those alone. Pragya Porwal writes, what tactics would you recommend for the F4U4 Corsair, not the F4U4B in Air RB? Hi there. It's great for air combat, so you shouldn't have any issues with it. Climb higher at the beginning of the battle and stick to frontal or energy attacks. It has Browning, so you can fire at long ranges and have enough time to dodge incoming rounds. You can even turn fight some enemies on the Corsair. It feels pretty confident in vertical maneuvers. And the last comment for today was written by MJ Stas. Leo 2 PSO or 2A6? Hello! Today's questions are all comparisons, huh? Well, in this case, we'd bet on a draw. One of them has better pen, the other one has better armor. Both are equally amazing, though. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget that a standard keyboard has more than 100 buttons. Leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.